It is Romans that tells us that Israel is no longer the chosen nation of God. It has been that way for a while, but it is Paul who is the regarded as the greatest Jew in the New Testament. Uh, he's not necessarily that, but that's what he uh, sarcastically or in human terms called himself. And he is trying to get over the idea that Israel is no longer God's chosen nation. They blew it. But what he wants to at the same time talk about the new Israel. And that is there's only one way that Israel can exist, and that is in Jesus Christ. Now, believe it or not, there are people who teach. They don't say it this way, but this is what they tell you. That right now, God is very angry with Israel. But it is only a temporary thing that God is having a temper tantrum and that God, when he's having this temper tantrum has told Israel, you are not going to be my people any longer until the tribulation starts happening. And then the rapture starts taking place. And then that's when God gets over his temper tantrum. Now I know they're not going to tell you God's having a temper tantrum, but that's actually what they're describing. The tribulation is not going to happen. The rapture is not going to happen. Judgment day is going to happen and take place. There is a major difference between the two. And incidentally, um, this tribulation and rapture teaching uh, didn't even start until about 1914, uh, when somebody thought that uh, the start of World War I was the, the start of, the, of this. And nobody even knew what a, a rapture was before that. You can't find the term in the Bible whatsoever. And so Paul says, look, I, what I want is for my people to be godly. I want them to be holy again. I want them to be what they should be. But they're not. I mean, look at the guy who writes this, go back to Acts chapter 9 for a minute, and you'll see what I'm talking about. He is on his way to Damascus with letters from the Jewish councils called the Sanhedrin Council, and what he is doing is he's going to take and arrest these men and women, well, only had Jews at the time that were Christians, and he's going to take them back to Jerusalem give them what I term a monkey trial, that is, he's just going to pronounce them guilty, and then he's going to he's going to be a part of the stoning to death, or he's going to be a part of watching it, or he's going to be approving it, just like he did Stephen in Acts 7. Well, here's the thing. There's only one person that could convince Paul that Jesus Christ was alive. Who do you think that was? Jesus Christ, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. I mean, he's on his way. He knows what he's about to do. He knows what's about to take place. And when he gets to that bright light, wherever it is, he's got these two guys with him. And he can't see anything. The two men, he doesn't, he, he thinks they can't see anything. He's not even sure. And all of a sudden he hears this Paul or Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Acts 9.4 is one of my favorite verses because he doesn't say, who are you? He, said, he doesn't say, who's there? He doesn't say, here I am, Saul. He says, who are you, Lord? And when Jesus tells him who he is, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Don't you know it is hard for you to kick against the pricks? And I'm not trying to be vulgar. Somebody got on to me one time about that. That's the King James Version of that. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, what would happen is when the oxen would be pulling plows, they, they designed a little instrument. And when that ox would kick, it's one of the, it hits one of the major arteries in, in an ox. And so you're bleeding to death. You're dying. 
that's the point Jesus is making. And so he tells he, he tells Saul, go to the street called straight and you'll be told what you need to do in order to be saved. And so he waits three days and three nights. He doesn't eat anything. He doesn't drink anything. Jesus tells Ananias, go tell him what he needs to do in order to be saved. Ananias, I'm going to paraphrase here, but it's biblical. Are you sure we're talking about the same guy? <laughs> I mean, to, to Ananias, this, is to, this would be to us that you're converting Adolf Hitler. Okay? Are you sure we're talking about the same guy here? Or as uh, Arnold used to say on different strokes, what you told me was. I mean, that's, that's what Ananias is thinking. And he says, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine. Ananias walks in, tells him, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And Saul, Paul said it was like something like scales that fell from my eyes. And he said, he told him, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then when Saul goes to the temple where he can legally go, guess what he's doing? He's preaching the very one he went to condemn and destroy. And they are trying to kill him. Because they think he has lost his mind. He has to be let down by a basket. On one occasion, uh, some Jews made a vow right after that never to eat again until they killed Paul. Well, the uh, centurion guard put plenty of guards there to make sure he got to, to his uh, trials. And so here, here's Paul now telling us and by the way, he, he kind of reiterates some of this in Galatians 2. When Peter is visiting with the Gentiles, and, they, and all of a sudden, whoever these influential Jewish brethren, he just leaves the Gentiles alone. He won't even speak to them, won't even give them the time of day. Even Barnabas, who brought Paul into the fellowship, was, was pulled away with that. And, P and Paul says, I was stood Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. And apparently they got it worked out. Peter must have admitted he was wrong because Peter writes some great things about Paul, especially in 2 Peter 3. There are some people who, who read Paul's words and they twist them to their own destruction. Well, Paul was an attorney. Uh, there's a commentator in the church named Guy in Woods, and he was an attorney. And some of the, if you've ever read his commentaries, you have to get a dictionary. Uh, for example, the aorist tense. What is that? I had to go get a dictionary and figure out what aorist was. A-O-R-I-S-T. And what it basically is is present tense. Well, why didn't you just say present tense? Because <laughs> that's not the way an attorney thinks. <laughs> and so Paul is an attorney. He's been trained by the greatest attorney in his day, Gamaliel. And that's how he can make the argument and he's going to use the argument that it is not God who let God down. It's not God who let the people down. It is the people who let God down. They didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Already he has told us, you cannot have forgiveness of sins under the law of Moses. Because do you have to be perfect to follow the law of Moses? Yes. Now I have a... Dumb question, not because you're dumb. How many of you are perfect? Yeah, right. Nobody is. And if you were guilty of one part of the law, how much of the law you were guilty of? All of it. And the punishment was to die. And so Paul has told us back in chapter 8, that great news, there's no for, therefore now con any condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Wonderful. They do not walk according to the flesh, but they walk according to the spirit. But the Jews thought that has nothing to do with it. They thought all this had to do with was that you got a temple in Jerusalem and you just follow certain laws. Problem is they couldn't follow them. They couldn't follow them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We pray we use it wisely and Father, we, we pray we continue to do what you want. We pray for Jackie as she's at home sick tonight and some others that have been affected by the smoke with their uh, sicknesses, allergies. And Father, we're, we're still so concerned about the people who are losing their homes and, 
and biggest wildfire in, in the nation's history, and especially in our history anyway. And Father, we just pray for them. Pray tonight that you'll be with us as we study and have a great greater appreciation of what you did through your son Jesus and how the Holy Spirit makes sure it's still truth. Bless us tonight, please, and it's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. All right. So now, Paul says in chapter 7, that great line that talks about we are, we live two different lives almost. I don't mean we live apart from God, but we are to live spiritually while we have human limitations. And there's no question about that. I mean, there are times that we don't do what God wants us to do. And so chapter eight, God remedied the problem. He remedied the problem by saying simply, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So with the mind, I serve the law, but with the flesh or with the, the spirit, I serve Christ. Now, chapter nine, the first thing he starts off with is the big three to emphasize this sorrow. You can't get any bigger than this. And I don't mean there are three different gods, but we know them as God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. We call it the Trinity. Those three right there in chapter nine, verse one, are going to attest to what Paul says. Can you get any greater than that? The answer is no. So Paul is emphatic about his sorrow. I, I have people, I, I've told you this before, but I have, I have family members that I'm sorrowing over today because I know where they are and they're not with Jesus. They gave up. They got discouraged. They let the world beat them. They let Satan whip them. And I know they're not right because they, they just wouldn't stay with it. Paul feels what two things, sorrow and anguish. You put the two together, and that's exactly where Paul is. And he's sorrowful over the fact that the Israelites had these things in their possession, but didn't appreciate it. This almost reminds you of the pop singer, um, MC Hammer. MC Hammer at one time was worth $175 million. MC Hammer went bankrupt. And the reason is because out of his good heart, he hired everybody. He hired people that, that weren't doing anything. And, and while that's great and wonderful, you, you, you can't just give it all away. And that's what the Israelites did. They just went bankrupt. For example, look at chapter 9, verse number 4. They forgot. They ignored. They took in. They did not take into account the adoption. The adoption. Yeah, Hosea 11, 1. Out of Egypt, I have loved Israel. It wasn't important to them. They thought it was more important to, to mix pagan religion with godly religion. They, they, you remember they loved the Baals. Jezebel and Ahab got that going. And then you'd get rid of the Baals and they'd come back. And then you had, and then you had uh, things going so great and so well in the economy that when Jeremiah was preaching his message, what did they do to Jeremiah? They threw him in prison on several occasions. In fact, one time they threw him where the sewer was about right here to his mouth. They almost let him drown. And they went to the princes who had at least a little bit of morality and said, well, doesn't Jeremiah deserve to die? And they went, no, he's telling the truth. But they still didn't release him from jail. In fact, he got treated better by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, than he did his own people. Isn't that sick? The glory. I mean, when Moses is there in, in Exodus 34, and he wants and he wants 
the glory. He wants to see the glory. He wants to see God. And Moses saw God face to face. In fact, his face shined so bright he had to wear a veil. Nobody could look at him. Now, when he went into the presence of God, before the mercy seat, he could take the veil off. They had it. Wasn't that important? In fact, let me just show you. Go to the very last book of the Old Testament. And I'll, I'll just prove it to you. Malachi chapter 1, verse number 2. This is a classic example of, of what we're talking about here. I have loved you, says the Lord God. Malachi 1, verse 2, last book of the Old Testament. I have loved you, says the Lord. And the people went, you bet. We got it. You loved us. That's right. Amen. Is that what they said? No. What did they say? How have you loved us? Now, you can continue through the book and see it, but just alone, his own people telling him that he did not love them? Oh, my. The covenants. I mean, you've got the Abrahamic covenant. Through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. you got the Mosaic covenant, which led us to Christ. Oh, my. The giving of the law. The law wasn't a bad thing. That's what Paul's going to tackle here in just a minute. The service of God, you got to, I got to, if I was a Jew under that system, I got to serve God. I got to wait on God. We had a friend of ours, and uh, she, uh, she got hired as a babysitter for a couple out of Cliff. And they uh, they said, well, you can't be around this weekend. She was going to go out and just kind of hang out. And, well, you can't go around this weekend. Well, why not? Well, you just can't. And they kept asking. She kept asking and the owner of the house, very nice lady and mother. She said, uh, uh, George Strait's going to be here this weekend. He comes out here once a year to hunt, once a weekend or once on that weekend. And this is his weekend to hunt. Now, she didn't want to go out there and, and do that for free, did she? You know the number one George Strait fan wanted to be there the whole time. And like I said, I don't know what that movie crew was doing down at Crucis. They're filming something. But, man, i never seen so many people going in and out. One had an Oklahoma van I wanted to go ask, but we were getting ready to go. But, uh, but can you just imagine? When the governor of Oklahoma, back when I was a sophomore in high school, I thought he was taking off. I wasn't going to let him leave without him shaking my hand. I wouldn't. He was standing right there. And then, of all things, he knew where my hometown was. I couldn't believe it. He said, where are you from, son? I said, I'm from El Dorado. And he said, oh, down there in southwest of Altus, right near the Texas line. How do you know where El Dorado is? Most people don't even know what I'm talking about. The service of God, we got to do that. The promises through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And they had the opportunity to take advantage of that. They didn't do that either. The patriarchs, Abraham. You see, Paul's going to tell us in Galatians 3, verse 29, if you're Abraham's seed, or if you're Christ's seed, you're Abraham's seed, and your heirs according to the promise. We're not Jews physically. Don't go home thinking that, but we are Jews spiritually because that's what God wants. And they had the opportunity, I mean, they had the opportunity for the Christ. I'm kind of jealous of them. Maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but they got to see Jesus. How many people have, have I ever heard say, man, I just want to see Jesus? I just want to see Jesus. And I said, well, what do you want to see Jesus for? I just want to know what he looked like. Now, he doesn't look as good as our pictures, I know. And respectfully speaking to that 
little boy in the movie Heaven is real. It didn't look like that either. I can't disprove it, but Isaiah said there wasn't anything we desired about him. I told told brethren here one time, I said, what Isaiah said was he was ugly. Well, don't say Jesus was ugly. Well, what do you want me to say? Well, I don't know. Just don't say he was ugly. There wasn't anything we desired about him. He had no form or comeliness, the Bible says. In fact, he you go to John 2, he's the guy sitting over in the corner. He, he didn't want to be at the, he didn't want to really be around. In fact, that's what he said. What has your problem got to do with me <laughs> when he turned the water into wine? And how many jokes have gone along with that? They had it. And what'd they do with it? They crucified him. What'd they do with him? They crucified him. So now, here's what Paul's going to really drive home. Israel, or God rejected Israel because Israel rejected God first. God did everything he could to bring them to Mount Sinai. And when he got them there, what did they do? They made a what? Golden calf. Aaron made a golden calf and said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. I don't know about you, but, you know, that first time they started griping and complaining because they didn't have any water. Okay. He provided water. Enough for the... the Israelites and their livestock, and they had water running over. And then they complained they didn't have anything to eat, and so God gave them manna, literally, what is it? And they got sick of the manna. Can't you give us meat to eat? Now, right there, I think I would have been, you know what? We've had enough of this. And so God said, I'm going to give you so much meat, it's going to, you're going to feel like it's coming out your nose. But you cannot pick, you can pick enough meat for six days, or I'm sorry, enough bread for six days. Talking about the manna. But don't pick any on the seventh day. What do they do? They go out and pick it, and it turned to rot. Moses says, how long are you going to disobey God? How long are you going to keep doing this? And then, oh, I remember... Oh, I remember how good we had it in Egypt. I remember how wonderful it was in Egypt. I didn't read any of that. Now, if anybody reads how good they had it, when God heard their cry, show me. You see, it's not that God's word was ineffective. You know, the, the Jews are going to respond to Paul. Well, it, it, was, it wasn't because we didn't obey it. It's because God's word wasn't effective. Really? I've watched God's word change people right and left. I've watched people avoid talking about the Bible because of the power in it. Well, I don't see anything electric on it. I don't see anything... Uh, yeah, I don't see, it's sort of like a guy was complaining one day about the fact, you know, you church Christ people insist on water baptism and everything. There's no power in that water. That's right. Unless you did like Ray Stevens did in vacation Bible school, put an eel in the, you know, in the baptistry. It has nothing to do with water. It has to do with obeying God. It has everything to do with obeying God. Now, he's going to talk about one child here, but he's going to make the distinction of two other children. Paul will do a, do a more definite or detailed job in Galatians 4, calls it an allegory. And the idea here is Abraham having how many sons? Two. One, though, is not the children or child of promise. 
One is the child of slavery. That is Hagar's child, Ishmael. The child of the free woman is Sarah. And when you're in Christ, that's who we are. We are the child of the free woman. And so these descendants are the descendants of Isaac, not Esau. When Esau wanted to have his birthright, what, I, uh, um, I'm sorry, when Jacob and Esau, when Esau wanted to have his birthright, Isaac and Rebekah didn't realize something. He sold his birthright for a morsel of food. He was so hungry, and Jacob had a stew, and Jacob said, sell me your birthright. And he did. And then, of course, you know the, the, the story about Jacob and Rebekah tricked Isaac. By the way, do you know what the name Jacob means? It means deceiver. That's why God changed his name to Israel. And Jacob deceived, and he was deceived. He deceived his daddy. And guess who deceived their daddy? The ten sons. Well, he makes an interesting statement in chapter 9 and verse 13 that ties in with all that. And so people have tried to use Jacob 9, or Jacob, Romans 9, 13, pardon me, to justify hatred. What that guy did the other day in Buffalo was abominable. What he did was horrible. What he did was satanic. And that is, he killed those people because they were black. Only reason. But what our media misses and what our president misses is, who talked him into that? Oh, we're not going to recognize that Satan exists. Well, you should. That's what's happening now. He's having a field day with all of this. He is laughing his head off over this. Well, we can hate because God hated. There's a Greek word here. I'm not going to, I didn't bring it to, to quote it tonight. But the definition simply is, I've loved less. If God loves, and he does, 1 John 4, 7, and 8, that's his name. He can't hate. But of whom is he going to prefer? He's going to prefer his own children. That's the idea here. And so he says, look, you got to get this together. Because God was absolutely right to reject Israel. This just almost sounds unheard of. This just almost sounds unreal that God would do that. Because, I, I mean, I'm told by people all the time, if we... If we go against uh, Israel as a nation, God's going to destroy this nation. Well, I don't go in against Israel because of that. I don't, I don't even go against Israel. I think we ought to support Israel, but I don't think we should support them for religious reasons. And yet there, is, there are people who are building, if they haven't got it built yet, they are building a temple today. They are building a throne for Jesus to sit on it. If they rejected him the first time, what well, makes you think they're not going to do it the second time? Well, see, that wasn't really Jesus. That really wasn't Jesus at all. And, and this Christianity thing that you serve, Dwayne, is just a temporary thing anyway. And God's going to do away with that one of these days. And really? When, when is Jesus going to die? He's not. He's alive. How long is he going to live? Forever. Well, if the church is his body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that stands to reason that just because they're building that thing does not make it right. So he asked the question, is God unjust? Well, that's what the Jews are going to say if God rejected Israel. That's what some people are going to say. That's not right. 
that is not right at all. Well, Paul says, King James, I love it. God forbid. God's not unjust. I mean, if God, and we're going to look at it in chapter 11. Here's what God has the right to do today. God has the right to kick every one of us out of his church. God has the right to end it all right now. God has the right to do everything he intends to do and wants to do, and he can change it in a heartbeat. Is he going to do that? No. His will is already set. It is by mercy, and this is so hard. This is so hard to get in our hearts. It's easy to get in our heads. But our hearts, it's so hard. Mercy is according to his divine will. Mercy is according to his divine will. Because judgment is according to his divine will. Here's God. And he's done what he's always done. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son into the world. And I'm going to save the world that wants to be saved. Are there people today that do not want to be saved? I'm not sure of that, but do they live that way? Yes. Yes, they do. They live every day not wanting to be saved. And they live as though God's not paying attention. They live as though God's not even paying any attention to anything going on. And sometimes we think that too. God, are you really, are you really there? Um, I'll make you a deal. That's what arbitrary means. I'll make you a deal, God. Now, the deal I'll make you is that I'll do A and you got to do B. And God says, you got to do my well. Oh, no, 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 I don't. No, I don't, I don't do any of that church stuff. Jeff Allen is now a, a Christian comedian, and, but he told his best friend. When his best friend says, well, they, they were talking, and he said, well, I read the Bible every day. And Jeff Allen says, are you nuts? Are you crazy reading the Bible? He said, that tells you not, you can't do things. It also tells you there's things you can do. And he said, and, the, and his friend said it changed his life. How did it change, his, how did it change your life? They said, just read it. So then he turns around and he said, well, at best you're an agnostic because you're recognizing God. You have to be a higher, you have to be as high a power as God to deny the existence of God. And he said, so at best you're an agnostic. He said, what does that mean? He says, well, you recognize that people think God exists. And you recognize at least that there's, there's somebody called God. And he said, finally, I started reading it. And guess what? My friend was right. <laughs> My friend was right. God's will is not arbitrary. You can't make a deal with God. And yet, a friend of mine was telling me that another a guy was an experienced carpenter. And he said, God, I don't want to follow your will, but I'll make you a deal. I'll make enough, I'll build enough mansions in heaven if you'll let me just go to heaven because I'm an experienced carpenter. Somebody reminded me, I wonder what Jesus did for a living when he was living on earth. <laughs> so does God treat mankind like puppets? I've heard people say that. They didn't say it in those words. But Paul says, look, look at verse 19. You'll say then, why does he still find fault? Or who has resisted his will? And this I love. Verse 20. Who are you? You know where Paul got that? I know he got it from the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but he got the idea from Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah, Jeremiah goes to the pot. God sends him to the potter's house. And he says, what do you see? And he says, I see a potter with clay. So what's he doing? The potter is forming the clay. 
And God says, what I want you to tell my people is I'm the potter, you're the clay. And yet the clay is telling, trying to tell the potter what to do. Now, Jeremiah, does that work? It doesn't work. It doesn't add up. It does not add up at all. So who are we to question God? And he's going to repeat this again. God is just. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and one for dishonor? So what if God wanted to show his wrath and to make his power known endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory? Even as he as uh, even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so he quotes from Hosea. I will call upon them my uh, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved and it is it shall come to pass in the place where it was said you're not my people there they shall be called sons of the living God now what he means there don't go home thinking that that there's not sons of God and there are sons of God here Gentiles the Gentiles weren't there in that list but now they are verse Isaiah he also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as the Lord said, and as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Seboeth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been like Gomorrah. So God is just. God's truthful, and God's merciful. God is merciful, God is truthful, and God's just. Now, here's, here's the problem we have with this justice thing. Okay, I know if I get pulled over tonight, and I don't plan to, if I get pulled over tonight by a cop for driving 75 miles an hour between here and Silver, and you can ask my family, that's not going to happen. And I told the cop, well, I don't believe you. Now, raise your hand if you think the cop's going to not give me a ticket or the cop's not going to argue with me. Really, you're right. <laughs> now, he might let me go. He might say, just be real careful, slow down, because there are enough people between here and Silver that are driving 80 and 90 these days. And, and but, wait a minute. If God is just, he's supposed to punish me because I'm guilty. And God says, because I'm just, you're innocent. Wrap your head around that one, because it, is a problem for me. <laughs> so what if God wanted to show his wrath? He can't show his wrath? Well, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Which he talks about. What happened in Ananias and Spire? What happened when, when God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go in and just besiege Jerusalem and take that temple and cut it to the ground? That was all part of God's wrath. What if he wanted to show his power? You see, I hear a lot more people want to show. I, want, I hear people say, show us your power. I don't think they're prepared for that. I'm not. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, if you go back to Exodus 19 and Exodus 20, and then you read Hebrews 12, what did Moses say? Just in that example alone, it was an exceedingly dreadful sight. All those thunderings and lightnings and noises. I mean, I can I can only imagine what it must be like in eastern Ukraine with what Russia's doing. But God's a whole lot more powerful now. Wow. But what if God wanted to ensure that Jesus arrived? You see, I am not going to stand here tonight and tell you that I have God figured out. I thought I had him figured out years ago. But the one thing I do know is God's done everything he can for one reason. 
and that is to bring Jesus to this earth. He did that to bring him. For example, why did he let David live when David committed adultery? And yet, why didn't he let James live, who was the, who was the one of the prominent apostles? I don't know. But I know why he let David live, because somebody's got to come. I know he, he had no more need of James on earth, but he's well taken care of James. He is well taken care of James. In fact, I have brethren that tell me all the time, I wished I was like him. I wished I could go on. And sometimes that's what we feel, but he's still got stuff for us to do here. And this <laughs> is where the Jews, and this is where, how, how can I put it delicately, friction hits. And that is, it is so much easier for us to just do things. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be easier if you just had a check sheet every day? I mean, you, you do a check sheet anyway. I'll tell you my check sheet. I get up. In the morning, cat goes with me. She makes sure I make it to the kitchen. I have, I make my coffee. I usually eat leftovers or I find something there to eat for breakfast because I've taken my medicine. I take my medicine. I'm usually trying to make Brie a cup of coffee. She drinks it cold. Ugh. And, and she goes to work and I go to work. And I usually get home between 4 and 4.30. And, and by the way, Christopher comes over. We call him the stowaway. He comes from the high school. And then we go home. And, and then we're here on Wednesday. And, and on Monday and Tuesday, we have things going on. And, and then about 9 o'clock, I'm usually going to the bedroom, getting ready for bed. That's the check sheet. Wouldn't it be great if that's, that's what we... But... Salvation is not a checklist. I know sometimes people think it is because we have to do things, but salvation is by grace. Salvation is by grace through faith. And so it's not based on works. Now, don't go home thinking that we have to do nothing because that's not going to work with Paul's argument here. And I'm just going to put these in. Um, we read them just a minute ago. But God chose to bless Israel. He didn't have to. He never had to look upon their cries. In fact, isn't it interesting how God did this? Where did the children of Israel live? They lived in, in, in Canaan. What's the promised land? Canaan. But what did God do? God caused a famine. And so where did they go? They went to Egypt. And what did God do? God sent a guy by the name of Moses to get them out. And where did he lead them? He led them to Mount Sinai. He would have led them where? Canaan. But 40 years, they had to wait for that generation to die off. And then, where does he lead them? Canaan. I mean, just think about the story of the Red Sea. God didn't have to lead them the way he did. If you look on a map, go up north, that's all where God had to lead them. And it was a lot shorter from Ramesses. But that isn't the way God works. <laughs> God led them right to the Red Sea, and he led them to the deepest part of the Red Sea as well. So, same idea here. Israel rejected God. And so, the Babylonian captivity came. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me back up. The Assyrian captivity came. The Babylonian captivity came. The Persian captivity came. The Grecian captivity came. The Roman captivity came, and therein, when the Persian government, the second government, Daniel 2.44, when they went in, that's when the remnant went home. 
Now, I personally believe, I cannot prove, but I really believe that that's where we are today. Not since the 1940s has people not said they have a religious affiliation. Well, they're religious. They just don't ascribe to any church. That scares me. Oh, not because I'm interested in, I'm interested in liturgy. But what does that really mean? God's convenient. God's like a convenience store. You just, you know, when you want him, you go. And when you don't, you don't. However, we are in the remnant stage. I can remember, my goodness, I can remember the days when you had three and 400 in a building. Madison, or uh, Ira North, the former preacher at Madison, would be rolling over today if he saw the Madison congregation. The Madison congregation at one time had 6,500 people going to church. They do well to get 300. It's just sad. People have died off. I, I know that. But we're in that remnant state. So the Jews failed to obtain the righteousness of God with trying to do things. In other words, well, God's there. But we're going to do what we want. And as long as we have that temple, God's fine with us. Paul says, nope, that isn't the way it works. And what really was frustrating the Jewish Christians, much less the Jews, was the fact that a Gentile could be saved not the same way they were. In other words, they were born into it. We're begotten into it. There's a little different. I'm talking born physically. And then I'm talking born spiritually. And so he quotes from Isaiah 8, 14. That's the last two uh, quotes there. And then what he says is what we know. Look at chapter 10, verse number one. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer, and it's mine too. To God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but what? Not according to knowledge. That's the problem. It isn't that they don't want to do what God wants. It's they don't want to read it. They don't want to accept it. Because what Paul says to the Jews, the story of the cross is, a stumbling block. To Gentiles, it's pure foolishness. How could one man die for the world? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Yeah, to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Look at verse 3. For they be ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Here's why. Who did they reject? Christ. If I do the same thing, I, fa I face the same fate. In fact, Hebrews 10, 26 says, if I sin after I have a willful knowledge of the law, talk about the perfect law of liberty, there is no longer a sacrifice for sins. Now, does that mean you can't be forgiven? Of course not. God's in the forgiving business. But if you don't know you need it, I mean, how many times have I, when I was a principal, I'd have a parent, can't tell you how many times, I'd have a parent come up and they'd say, well, I'm so mad at you right now. I said, well, tell me what you're mad about. And they tell me this story and I'd look at them like this. And they'd stop in the middle of the story and say, you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? I got the first clue. For example, one parent walked in my office. She says, my son's being bullied and I'm tired of it. And the parent that afternoon said, man, when somebody talks to you, you do something about it, don't you? And I said, well, if I don't know anything about it, I can't do anything about it. 
They're ignorant of God's righteousness. God wants them to be saved. But you see, they reject Christ. And the only way you can be saved is to be in Christ. And what he's hoping and what he's praying about is that they do obey the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time tonight. Thank you so much for the good news. And thank you for the opportunity. It doesn't matter who you are, but to be obedient to your commands. You accept all who want you. And Father, we thank you for that promise you've made. But realizing the promises are conditional, sometimes we have blown it as well. We ask you forgive us. We appreciate, honor, and revere that sacrifice made on the cross and the sacrifice that's been empowered by the resurrection. Be with us as we go home tonight. Keep us safe and in your care and forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. I thank you for being here tonight.